Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today's 1 million by 1 million strategy roundtable for entrepreneurs. 1M by 1M, as you know, is the first and only global virtual accelerator in the world. Our mission is to help a million entrepreneurs reach a million dollars and beyond in annual revenue. And in support of that mission, we do these free mentoring roundtables week after week after week. We started way back when, in the fall of 2008, and today we've done over 500 sessions and uh, over 150,000 people have participated. So it's, a, it's become quite a vibrant uh, venue where we simmer in entrepreneurship and, uh, and have a lot of fun. So uh, this is the 511th session, and uh, the event is being recorded. Every single recording is available on our YouTube channel, 1M1M Roundtable. On Twitter, we're at 1M by 1M and at Stromana. Today, if you're uh, live tweeting, please use hashtag 1M by 1M. This is a roundtable, not a broadcast, so we want you to participate. And in fact, we have a very interactive segment. Um, I think we have three segments. We have a segment with an investor first, two entrepreneur segments, and the third. And the fourth segment is um, a, a very interactive brainstorming session on a particular idea that I have published that a lot of people have expressed interest in executing on. So we'll, we'll have a, a conversation around that. So we're going to have lots of interaction today. We are going to start today's session with a conversation with Fabrice Grinda, founding partner at SJ Labs. Fabrice, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. So let's uh, get you acquainted with our audiences. Tell us a bit about your background as well as SJ Labs. Yeah, I mean, briefly, I've been a tech entrepreneur and founder and investor for the last 22 years. So I've actually always held the dual role of, um, of of building companies and investing companies. I think by virtue of being a consumer-facing internet CEO, a lot of other entrepreneurs are asking for for investment. The last large company I've built is a company called OLX, which in the Middle East uh, owns Dubizzle, which is one of the largest class size sites in the world with um, 5,000 employees, 350 million unique visitors a month in, in 30 countries. And in 2013, uh, when I sold the company and lost as CEO, I realized I'd made over 100 angel investments. I loved investing in companies. I loved building companies. And so I created a hybrid venture fund and startup studio called FJ Labs, where every year we invest in over 100 startups. And every year we build one or two startups at Novo. And to date, um, we've launched kind of officially in 2016. We've made over 600 investments and we've built over 10 companies. And it's going uh, well. And what uh, check size are we talking about? So because, uh, so first of all, we play mostly in the early stages. So we're pre-seed, seed, seed extension, and A investors for the most part, but we also will invest later, uh, even first time checks. Uh, and we don't lead, we don't price, we really behave more like angel investors in terms of like being super thoughtful and helpful. And we, we write reasonably small checks. We never want to be competing with the large VCs from an allocation perspective. We have minimum check sizes or ownership requirements. Average check size around 500K, um, and it varies. Like at seed, it's like 250K. At seed, it's like 500K. At A, it's like 750K. At B, it's like a million. And, and it's always signed in a way to not be competing with the leads. How uh, big is the fund at JLA? So the current fund we're investing and um, actually not including your capital. To date, we've deployed about 270 Sorry, uh, million. You, you broke off for a moment. I did not catch. What did you say? How big is the fund? Uh, so fund, fund two, which is the fund we're currently being deployed out of, is about 175 million. And to date, we've deployed about 270 million, of which over 100 million is actually personal capital. And uh, we deploy these days uh, over 50 million a year. And which, you know, makes the math kind of work, right? 100 investments, 500K a pop, uh, that's 50 million. Okay. And uh, what do you like to invest in in terms of sector or style of business? What's your sweet spot? So we we have one very, one specificity, and that is the business model that we like to invest in. And the business model we like to invest in are marketplaces. 
We like to invest in companies that are intermediaries between buyers of something and sellers of something. Mm-hmm. Now, that could be a service. It could be a product. It could be multiple. There could be multiple. Models. And so, you know, something like Alibaba, which we invested in back in the day, uh, would, would qualify. But also many of the fintech startups that are intermediaries between uh, the borrowers and the lenders are marketplace. And yeah. so sweet spot. So marketplaces is really the, the, the focus. But then beyond marketplaces, it's every geography, every every industry, every stage. But that said, there's more still areas where we focus more than the other. So on average, it, we're 70% seed, 70% U.S., uh, and 70% marketplaces. But that said, we are global investors. We're 20% of Western Europe and 10% of the rest of the world. We have like uh, I think 10 investors in the Middle East. We have a number of investors in India, in Brazil, and, and, and other emerging markets like Nigeria, Kenya, you know, Algeria, et cetera. And um, while we are mostly early, uh, we do have 30% of the investments that are actually Series B, Series C, Series D, et cetera. Okay. So let's, um, let's do some examples of what you've invested in and, um, you know, that are representative and that you're particularly proud of and, uh, and learn a bit more about your companies. Yeah, so I, the, we started, or what we really like, is, first of all, we're thesis driven. So we actually think through, okay, where is the world heading from mm-hmm. a general direction perspective, and both in marketplaces and in meta trends. So we have a specific thesis of, three things that are happening right now in marketplaces. One is the multi-category horizontal size are being verticalized. And so an example yeah. there would be taking a vertical of eBay and we invest in a company called like TCG Player. They're a magic, the gathering marketplace. So to most people that might sound ridiculous, but actually they're doing 200 million or, or more in sales and they're doing really well because they've taken a category and they completely own it. We're verticalizing yeah. a, lot, a lot of the food companies. So in the U.S., you know, you have Uber Eats, you have Seamless Grubhub, you, you, have, you, you have DoorDash, uh, but we, we've invested in a company called Slice. Slice is a pizza uh, food company, and they're probably on track to do over a billion in sales next year, and they're doing really well and are profitable. And, and most people look at these investors and are like, wait a minute, does it really make sense when you have these existing incumbents to actually create these verticals? And that's because... When you layer on our perspective and where the future of work is, they're putting themselves in the shoes of the consumer instead of the shoes of the provider. Right? Imagine you're Luigi, you own your little pizzeria. What is it you want to be doing? Well, you want to be cooking pizza. What is it you don't want to be doing? Picking up the phone, creating a website, answering questions on TripAdvisor and Yelp and, and Google. And so this company Slice does all the back office for these mom and pop pizzerias, allowing them to do the job they love to do. And over the last year, grown to probably what is going to be a billion-dollar company next year. And so these types of investments, like verticalized and very bespoke for each category, is something we've done a lot of. Like, for instance, we're investors in a company called RigUp. RigUp is an oil services labor marketplace. And so if you're Schlumberger and you want to hire a welder to work in a special drill in, in the North Sea, they will find you the person to do that. And they've grown to several billion a year in, in sales from nothing, and again, very integrated, working very deeply in their industry, and an intermediary between the workers, which is the supply, and the demand, which are the oil companies. Very good. Very interesting. And um, uh, we have seen, actually, several investors come and discuss vertical marketplaces. SaaS-enabled marketplace is a trend that we've heard quite a bit, where Absolutely. you have two sides of the marketplace, and you create a SaaS for each side, and then when you have critical mass, so you turn that into a marketplace. We're seeing that as well quite a bit. Are you seeing that in your portfolio? Oh, yeah, absolutely. The, the three trends in marketplaces are verticalization. They're reinventing the old school marketplaces where the buyer and the seller need to talk to one where the marketplace fix your supply. Uh, we call this marketplace spec. And the third one is B2B places. But overlaid on all of that is the approach to the market. And the approach that we're seeing that is the most common is building a SaaS tool for one or both sides of the market and giving it away for free to be embedded in the decision-making process in order to build a successful marketplace. So even the first one I, I gave an example of, the TCG player in the Magic the Gathering space, they actually provide a, a software solution to the comic book stores to manage their inventory and exchange a lot of them to post. So absolutely, SaaS-enabled marketplace is a mega trend, and it's happening in every 
factor. Yeah. So um, I, it, it sounds like your strategy is to go for the unicorns in uh, looking for the unicorns, yes? Well, yes and no. Obviously, we, all the companies we wanted, we invested, we want them to have the potential to be billion-dollar companies. And, and obviously, if you're building a venture startup, you need to be able to return venture-backed style returns, so the 10x return on investment. That said, in our case, we've actually, I mean, we've had over 150 exits, and we've made money on over half of these deals, and our average is like 4x. So you, we don't need you to be a unit to be to. Risk six or such that we be value companies that we we invest in valuations we deem fair in businesses that have good unit economics and so if we invest at a ten million valuation and we sell at fifty that's fine everyone everyone's happy so that said uh, we would we would like to have the potential upside of the company being a billion dollar company and in fact in our portfolio uh, twenty three companies have gone from zero to being a unicorn and another twenty five companies or so we invested in were already unicorns, but have created more than a billion in value since. So, um, you know, the other trend that we are seeing is, uh, you know, there are like a thousand plus micro VCs in the market right now, you know, fund sizes between 10 million, 15 million, 25 million, 50 million. And many of these funds are actually investing in you know, on, a, on an investment thesis that it's going to be a, an early exit, you're going to do something very capital efficient, solve a problem, and get a strategic exit in a couple of years or with a very small amount of investment. We are we are seeing that trend quite extensively. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, look, I would say that most of our assets actually come from secondaries along the way. Um, now, you can't exit any every company in the portfolio way you could only exit the very best ones the companies that are doing the best the vcs when they look at the next round or, or would like to get more exposure and are considering buying at buying at the early investors now you can only do that if you own a small percentage of the company because otherwise you're sending a very negative signal that you're selling and and the company is doing so well that people actually want to buy part of it and so it is definitely an, a, a, an increasing trend you can see that if you look at no, the but I think you are, you're hinting at a, at a different trend. I think you're right. That trend also exists. There are two trends. Um, people are selling to later round investors, the Series A, Series B investors, but I'm also talking about strategic exits where it's basically bootstrapping to exit straight away. There, that's not a negative signal. If you get a strategic offer. I know. Bootstrapping to exit, yeah, that, that would the type of thing we would like to fund because I think we want to keep, we want the optionality of the company being very very big. Yeah. But definitely, as a founder, by the way, uh, uh, bootstrapping exit is fantastic for you. You may you make you make you make a fair amount of money. The and 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 by the and and we're not against by the way as investors exits right. If you try to build a company and we realize oh this will work better if you're part of another group then we. In fact, my company I sold, I mean, it was already reasonably large, so it was hundreds of millions in value, but the, the reason I sold it, and I, I sold it to Naspers, which is the South African media company, yeah. is because I realized that it would be lo it would do a lot better with their financial backing and with the media that they could push than, uh, than as an independent company. I didn't sell because I wanted to sell. In my ideal world, I would have never sold it, but I realized that it was actually better for the company part of a larger group than to be independent. So these strategic actions, I mean, totally make sense. And, and, and when is the right time for the company to sell, you should, you should pursue them. But that said, would I want as an investor to back a team whose objective is to get a short-term strategic exit? No, not particularly, that's not particularly compelling. Yeah. So uh, what are your predictions on post-COVID trends? What are you seeing? What are you predicting, projecting? What, uh, what kinds of businesses would you like to invest in that are um, driven off the post-COVID uh, Well, first trends? of all, if you take a step back, uh, crises in general are, are, are extraordinary accelerators of underlying trends. And also, there are okay. extraordinary generators of productivity rate. I mean, if you look in, in the 20th century, the Great Depression is actually the period during which we had the highest productivity growth in the U.S. because necessity is the mother of invention. Now, of course, there's a whole human suffering that came along with it. By the way, if you look at the most interesting defining companies in the last decade, the 
Ubers and Airbnbs of the world or Slack and WhatsApp, they all came out of the 2007, 2008, 2009 recession. And, and it's not a coincidence because uh, for Uber, that's when you had the, the labor pool willing to be drivers and have a second job. And for Airbnb, you had people that needed ex- incremental income and, and it gave them the, they were willing for the first time to let people in their home. And the same thing is happening here. We're seeing a fundamental acceleration of, of e-commerce. Prior to, prior to COVID in the U.S., e-commerce 15% penetration of overall commerce and has grown to 25% and I don't see it going back. Uh, we had, we were only scratching the surface in telemedicine. Now we have 25% of the population that's actually had a virtual uh, telemedicine. Online education was only in its infancy and it's, and, and it, and it's accelerating pretty fundamentally. Yeah. Gaming is accelerating. And, and even, frankly, online public services. And so if we look at our portfolio, actually, despite terrible human health-wise and economic suffering, most of our startups are actually doing extremely well because – the, the underlying trends have been accelerated. So if you're in food delivery, for instance, we're seeing a lot of apps that multiplied by five or six X in a few months, much more so than they ever expected. And most of our e-commerce companies are doing really well. So that trend, I and mean, those trends will not change. We're not going to go back to the underlying base level. And so we're still investing very aggressively in everything that is towards the digitization of commerce, of health, of education, and, and, and of remote work. Now, remote work, Partly, there's going to be a, a form of level of return to the mean, even though greater flexibility is going to become the norm. Now, that said, there are a few sectors that are especially negatively affected uh, that we are not investing in right now because the time between a Series A or a seed and an A and an A and B is about 18 months. And if the company doesn't have the ability to get to the next stage, then it, it is, it's most likely going to die. So if you're in tourism, if you're travel, if you're in offline events, you know, you're, you're through no fault of your own, actually, unfortunately, penalized by COVID, and, and many of our companies in the portfolio have seen their revenues fall by 95% in these categories. But if I do a, 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 a stack ordering, 90% of the portfolio is doing at least as well as better or better than before, and of that, maybe half is doing extremely well, and then 10% is a total disaster. We want to continue being in, investing in line with the continued digitization of commerce, health, education, gaming, and, and, and remote work in general, and flexibility towards work in general. Yeah. Very good. Fabrice, thank you for your insights, and um, we'll, uh, we'll stop sending deals your way now that we have uh, established contacts and uh, had a conversation about your investment thesis. Thank you for coming today. No, thank you for having me. I'm always available, and uh, good luck. Thank you. Folks, we are going to um, we are going to actually have a discussion on a startup idea that uh, Maureen, are we doing this first, or are we doing entrepreneur pitches first? I thought we were doing entrepreneur pitches first. Ideas first. Okay. All right. Okay. Maureen tells me we're doing ideas first. So we are going to – so for let me set the context for what this segment is going to be all about. If you've been following my work, you know I have recently published eight startup ideas for the post-COVID world, and entrepreneurs have been starting to work on some of these. The first idea – in that, uh, Maureen, could you share that eight startup ideas for the post-COVID world post? Um, in there, there is an idea called facilitating travel experiences, and that one, uh, one of the the one million by one million entrepreneurs have already picked up and started working on. Um, his name is Abe Laderman. And Abe was actually a member of the One Million by One Million program earlier on for about three years, and he has recently sold his company and was looking to start another, and he zeroed in on this idea, and he's working on it. He's he's back in the One M by One M program. He's working with me on a regular basis, and he is developing that idea. So um, in general, my guidance to entrepreneurs who are looking at taking these ideas and doing something with them, let me just give you the sense of what what are your options. First and foremost, these ideas are free. 
and I have published them. They're available in the public domain. So they are without royalty. You can take any of these ideas and do anything you want with it. You don't have to check in with me. You don't need my permission. I have basically put them out there and you can do whatever you want with it. And then some of the entrepreneurs who are key zeroing in on these ideas are choosing to work with me. And, and there are, you know, the option there is what Abe is doing. Abe has come back to the one and by one and program and he has picked up one of the ideas and is working with me as part of the one and by one and premium program. You can do that as well if that's, if that's something that you want to do. Now, um, this particular idea we're going to spend more time on today, and maybe we'll spend idea, uh, time on other ideas as well as we go along, but this one is particularly interesting to me um, because I also have a close friend who's a venture capitalist who loves this idea, and we've been kicking this one around, and, and it's one that I'm extremely passionate about. So if you decide to work on this idea and if you decide to join 1M by 1M Premium and work with me on this idea and then we get to a situation where you build enough, uh, you know, enough of validation and momentum and so forth so that we, we my friend, um, this investor wants to invest in your idea, then there's a very good possibility that I might join your board and, you know, take a more active interest. Now, Regardless of that, anybody who picks up any of these ideas and decides to work on these within the One Million by One Million program, I will introduce you to investors. You know, we have we work with hundreds of investors. I will introduce you to those investors um, if you are ready to be introduced. So, so many options here. Let's double click down on this one, and I think. Um, it's, it's a really, really interesting one. Uh, let me just summarize the idea and then we're gonna start brainstorming about it and I will start answering questions. There are many entrepreneurs who actually wrote to me uh, in this last week expressing interest in this idea. If you're here today, please uh, join the broadcast and, and, uh, and open up your audio line so that you can weigh in. So while you do that, let me summarize the idea. In December 2017, I wrote a piece called Let's Go Beyond Superficial Virtual Interactions in 2018, encouraging my readers to look for opportunities to interact more in person through meaningful activities shared. Uh, and, and I shared my own experience with our liter literary group, Caravan Sarai Literati. At the end of 2019, upon request, I published our literati reading list um, as my readers were asking what we were reading. Well, little did I know at that point, so our literati used to meet once a month. Whatever book we were reading, we were meeting once a month for a literary salon with a very elaborate meal that often was uh, aligned with the theme of the book we were reading. And, and you know, at one point we were reading Nikolai Gogol and, and the friend of ours who was hosting that salon organized Ukrainian food and, and so on and so forth. It was a great deal of fun. Um, so, but, but I, you know, when COVID kicked in, literally to self-preserve, we had to go virtual and we had to operate through Zoom and um, there was no choice. So our wonderful in-person salon had to go virtual. Nonetheless, every evolutionary process comes with its own set of problems and opportunities. Today I'm going to reflect on a startup idea that is born out of the isolation that humanity is facing in the post-COVID world. Long before the coronavirus pandemic, humanity was already experiencing a loneliness as its pandemic. In quarantine, a lot of people living alone found themselves starved for emotional connection. As I watched Zoom become the social network of the COVID era, I also observed that it is not easy to spend an hour on small talk through video. In my own social network, I started suggesting salon-style discussion topics so that six people can actually have a meaningful conversation rather than chit-chat and shoot the breeze. The latter is wholly unsatisfying and leaves one empty and irritated. Through all this, 
Literati transitioned effortlessly into a lovely congregation of a dozen people discussing Sadat Hassan Mantel's bitter fruit in April, Virginia Woolf's Mrs. Dalloway in May, and Kurt Vonnegut's Slaughterhouse Five in June. Since then, we've read, read other books as well, and we are currently, oh, actually, we read uh, Speak Memory, Nabokov's memoir, in, in July. In August, we read Joyce's Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man. Uh, we just read Jane Austen's Emma um, in November. So it's, it's been a wonderful and very seamless transition. But I had started also thinking about a new social network to scale this idea so that other people can, can participate in, in an experience like this. So the question is, should we do a new social network? This makes me wonder if a social network can be built on top of Zoom or another video conferencing platform to bring together small literary groups that can explore meaningful friendships and deep connections. In doing so, I still believe that the in-person nature of the interaction needs to be the ultimate goal. COVID will one day end. Today's virtual-only interaction is not going to be a permanent condition. Humanity will again sit around the table and share meals. Thus, one of the primary conditions I would impose on this network is that it should be based on proximity. How far are members willing to drive? 30 minutes may be ideal. There may be other clustering algorithms that can drive matches for groups of eight to 12 people to come together. Shared alma maters could be one. Shared taste in literature could be another. Our literati, for example, reads a lot of classics and masterpieces. Another group may be interested in reading crime fiction from various countries like Australia. There's a wonderful series called Miss Fisher, Murder Mysteries. There's a series, uh, Botswana, this detective, lady detective called uh, Precious Ramatsawe, and so on. There is something magical about a group of, group of people getting to know one another through literature. The consistency of convening around meaningful, meaty topics on a regular basis has a recipe for long-term relationships taking root. And when these interactions eventually get back to being over meals, in person, these connections would further intensify. Notice the framework I'm discussing is one that consists only of small groups of eight to 12 people, no more, could be even six. Its effectiveness is in the concentrated attention, the process of getting to know one another deeply. Quite the opposite of the superficial virtual interactions flooding Facebook and TikTok. So let's talk about functionality. In reflecting upon what features and functions such a network would need to have, I go back to the Literati's workflow. We use Doodles for scheduling. One of us leads each salon and is required to put together study notes and discussion points. We use Google Docs and email for this purpose. The downside is that we do not have a central repository where we could access everything long term. It would be a nice to have. And each salon in person, after each salon, we upload photos to a Facebook group. We celebrate birthdays. Nothing terribly complicated, but some gentle workflow elements that enable a dozen people to collaborate and interact on an ongoing basis. The additional and more significant value of the social network would be in the matchmaking and clustering of bringing compatible people together. We built our group within our social networks. Everyone in it is someone's friend. Most of us have known one another for many years. But the social network we're considering as this venture would need to be able to bring compatible strangers together. It's a matchmaking of friendship. In doing so successfully, it would con contribute immensely towards alleviating the loneliness pandemic that is likely to last well beyond COVID-19. There is also the opportunity to create user-generated content around study guides and discussion notes to be shared across groups. And finally, virtual interactions around specific books that multiple groups are reading. But let's talk about business model and market size. My guess is that participants should be charged $10 a month or $100 a year to be in this community. This means with 1 million users, we're looking at 100 million annual 
recurring revenue as in this business. This is just back of the envelope. Is this possible? I think so. Can it be larger? I hope so. The population of lonely people who are also literature aficionados presumably is much larger than a million. Besides, the group could also be built around film or theater. We could watch film, we could watch theater. We, we love a series called National Theater Live that broadcasts the theater from England. Fabulous quality theater. Um, you know, there could be a group around that. In any case, a 100 million ARR business would be valued at a billion dollars. So in principle, this is a unicorn idea. If the ARR level gets to a billion based on 10 million users, now we are talking serious numbers. Humanity's search for human connection in the pre-COVID world led up to creepy trends like Tinder, swiping for matches and on-demand hookups, unhealthy to the extreme, damaging to self-esteem, soul-destroying, dangerous to the body, these trends have left people feeling hollow. I believe that a healthy, wholesome, soulful literature and film-based social network would create a different organizing principle for engineering small, deeply anchored communities. They would fill the world with meaningful friendships and even romance that blossoms in natural, organic ways, not the creepy sort. All right, so this is the idea that we are, um, you know, discussing today. Um, I'm going to let everybody who wants to talk, um, you know, weigh in and, and share your thoughts, what, you know, what makes you interested and, and what, uh, you know, what your thoughts are about this idea, and then we'll start brainstorming. I'll give you more insights into what I'm thinking and and learn more from you. So um, Emily Ackler and Tony Scott are on the call. Um, Emily is doing a startup in this area, and Tony has a film production company. Tony is a, a very long, uh, long-term long friend of mine. We did a cooking group together that was a hell of a lot of fun. So he has has some idea about what, what I'm talking about in these you know, small, you know, cohesive groups. So um, let's get um, Emily to start. Emily Ackler, could you please unmute your line and, and tell us what you're thinking on this idea? Sure. Uh, hi, everyone. It's uh, great to be here this morning. My name is Emily Ackler, and I'm uh, calling in from Chicago. I'm the co-founder and CEO of a startup called Italic Type. And uh, we are building a new community for avid readers and book lovers and people who want to connect and form friendships over books. Uh, very similar to um, a lot of the ideas that uh, Sharmana just discussed. Uh, we have been working on this. Yeah, so we are currently in um, a private beta with a few hundred early users on our platform right now, and we are actually just about to soft launch publicly in the next couple weeks. And does uh, your system have, or the way you have designed your, uh, your product, does it have these characteristics of being able to bring small groups together from among strangers? So we are started with the idea of wanting to build a new social network for book lovers. Um, you might be familiar with Goodreads, which is kind of the main incumbent kind of yeah. digital hub for readers today. It was bought by Amazon in 2013, and it kind of has this frozen in time quality to it, where it looks like not much has been done to the product in, uh, in about 10 years. And so we started with the observation that, um, Goodreads is really not a pleasure to use. It's uh, not a nice place to spend time, and that readers really want and deserve a, something better. Side, Goodreads is a review site. People go and review books there and read other people's reviews. It's not really a social media site. Well, um, the main experience is dominated with this, like, social feed that is imported from your Facebook friends that shows you what all your Facebook friends are reading. Um, I agree with you that it's uh, – not a place where there's a lot of interaction, but that is like 
the main, you know, 90% of the feature that you see on the home screen. Um, so we thought it could be done much, much better. Um, but we wanted to start with this idea that instead of building a really broad social network, we wanted to start with more of a kind of private walled garden sort of idea. So eventually we plan to match make and kind of connect strangers online. But to start with, we wanted to start with people that you actually know in real life. And so the big inspiration for me for starting Italic Type was I started a book club in Chicago about seven years ago. Um, and I started that book club because I had been a really big reader growing up always, but then went to college, started working after, and I still have the habit of reading for pleasure. Um, one day I woke up in my late 20s and I realized I couldn't remember the last time I read a novel. This was very disturbing to me. So I started a, a fiction book club to really address this and thought that with the social accountability of the group, um, that that would help me read more. And it did uh, help me read more in that way. And then also, uh, like you noted, um, just the positive effects of talking to people about books. You always learn something new from someone else's, you know, experience of what they bring to the book. And it's a really remarkable way to meet new people and create deeper relationships and create more meaningful connection. So I thought, wow, wouldn't it be great if everyone could be in my book club or if everyone could, um, could have this experience? And I thought, how can we kind of break off pieces of what's going on in that traditional book club experience and put it into um, a digital platform so that more people could have more access? So there, before COVID, uh, I thought there were all sorts of normal reasons why you might want to have a book club-like exchange with somebody that you don't live around. Um, you might have friends or former colleagues from other jobs or from school all over the country all, all, or all over the world, or maybe even just um, your schedules don't match up or somebody just had like a new baby and so they're not really available to meet at the same time, but they still want to read and they still want to have a discussion point with you. And so it's really um, our first prototype uh, is a system to connect with and invite friends and colleagues that you know in real life to read books with you at the same time and discuss along the way as you read. So you can you socially interact in, in two different ways. One is you can do a group read, which is reading a book together at the same time with one or more people. Or after you finish a book, you can send a direct personal recommendation to another reader. And when they start to read it, you get notified and you still have it and you have that same kind of chat message um, lined up to discuss. And our chat is also very intentionally not designed to be like real time IM. It does not take the place of a in person uh, meeting at the end of a, of a book club, for example, um, but really just a way to connect with people along the way and get the motivation and incentive to carve out more time to read um, in your daily life. And so our chat, like I mentioned, it's not real time, but it is excellent like a message board. So we batch email notifications throughout the day. So if somebody wrote a comment on one of my shared books with somebody else um, in the afternoon, I might get that at five o'clock and be like, oh, um, Maggie just read more of this book and now she's 50 pages ahead of me. I want to read tonight so I can catch up and talk to her about it. I see. So, so it's your your idea is pretty much an online idea. It's all it's all virtual interactions, and people are reading books together and interacting around books. That's that's what you're doing. Yes. And what's the business model? So we are um, pursuing a subscription model. It'll be um, like a freemium subscription where uh, you know some basic usage for free. So. Uh, the main Goodreads functionality that most people use is the ability to create your list of books, like kind of this is your book tracking, what I'm currently reading, the things that I want to read, and what I finished. And so we have that system as well, and that will likely be for free for users um, always. And then the subscription will kick in once you start using some of the premium features like the social interactions. And then we also have – um, another note-taking feature on what we call the book board. Every book you read on a tag type, you get your own um, dedicated book board space for, and that's your place to put all your notes and quotes and ideas and things that you want to extract and pull out. Mm -hmm. um, and so those will be the features that will kick in the monthly subscription. And we're thinking like 4 or $5 a month. 
All right. Well, Emily, very interesting uh, that that you're you're doing this. Let's hear from some of the other people on the call. Tony, do you want to talk next? Sure. Let me get my video started if I can. So I can say hi, everyone. So well, supposedly it's starting, maybe it's not. Anyway, um, hello all, I'm Tony Scott. I'm in Los Angeles. I'm the writer, director, and a former tech uh, person who you know, escaped from Silicon Valley a few years ago. The uh, interesting ideas from Mana, I think that, you know, I, I like, although I like the idea of being able to tie this into ultimate in-person uh, meetings, I think that the problem is that there are certain places where you could do that, say, for example, Silicon Valley or Chicago, perhaps, where there's a large enough population to get a group of people who want to discuss uh, Seneca's uh, histories of, or, or you know, ancient Greek philosophy or something, then you could probably do that. But if you're in Jackson, Mississippi, where I grew up, the likelihood of finding eight or to 12 other people or even four of the people who would all are be interested in doing that and, li and lining those people up into a group would be very low. Mm -hmm. and I think that, that I think that the idea of giving people who would be interested in discussing things of this nature with others, no matter where they are in the world, is mm -hmm. something to be positive. And I think that that might have a more broad application than if you try to force it into it has to be in a situation where people ultimately will get together on a direct face-to-face -face basis. So you could have options. You could have both options. A group can decide to be completely local and uh, sure. or a group can be uh, broader as well. Exactly. exactly. So, and I think that's, I think either way, either case is fine um, for people. Let people decide what they want. I'm not positive about the suggested pricing model. I think that would have to be tested to see whether or not people would be willing to pay, pay $10 a month or $100 a year. For this, I think especially if you're going to do that, then there would need to be probably more uh, content aggression from the from the from the company itself on a particular project. Can you like, for cut off for a moment? I, I couldn't hear the last bit that you said. Could you rewind and rerun? I said that on on the pricing model, if you're really thinking you're going to get ten dollars a month for a subscription. That there would need to be more that would be provided by the by the by the application in terms of, for example, if you're discussing a particular piece of literature or a, or a movie yeah. or art, that somebody is sort of the host to help do that. Think of the master class model a bit, even if it's just a, the same one person, let's say, talking about a particular book, maybe it's the author or that's a, a critic of a, you know a reviewer of the book. And we have that content that then helps provide the basis of the discussion around the around the particular uh, piece of literature, or film, or art, whatever you want to discuss. Mm -hmm. Because then it becomes a little bit more like there's a learning opportunity as well as a, it's a social interaction opportunity. So, yeah. So I think the, the one thing that we have learned in our book club is that the person who's leading a particular book has to do a significant amount of research to come up with the, you know, the background reading, the notes, and the discussion guidelines, and so forth. And, and that could all be provided as part of this um, service in that there is a whole repository of books and related uh, material to, to do a salon around or do you do a project around. Yeah, I mean, I think that what it does is it allows people to create salons more easily. Uh, yeah. Because then so much of it's already been, some of the hard, heavy lifting has been done for them. And it exactly. makes it more attractive for yeah, people. That was my intent all along, yes. Okay, good. We're on the same page. Yeah? Yeah. Um, so I think that that's really the the most important parts of it is to say, you know, what are what are people feel like they're getting from it, and from the application, as opposed to just another way to connect. Um, and it has to be, if you're going to be charging for it, then that's certainly going to need to be there. Also, obviously, there are advertising opportunities for this kind of a of a project. If you have people that are signed up for this, not only would publishers 
and also, you know, film distributors be interested because then they know, okay, these people are interested in these projects, these kinds of yeah, yeah. Uh, these kinds of things. Fine, we can have a very targeted uh, outreach to to them, and yeah, that's, yeah. Very, that's very positive. For example, if I know that there are people who have read uh, a bunch of romantic dramas and we're doing or watch a bunch of romantic dramas on a, in terms of film and that are engaged in that, if I can target that group of people, that's a very effective group that would, for a movie, that would be more of a romantic drama, right? Because it's, it would be very cost effective and, and help generate a virality of discussion out beyond the typical Facebook, uh, you know, YouTube, digital kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, very good point. You know, um, actually, let's listen to other people, and then um, then I'll, I'll share a few thoughts with you. One of the, you know, I, we just um, watched this movie, uh, this documentary, The Social Dilemma. Tristan Harris uh, and and others have talked about uh, all the different techniques, tools, and techniques that social media sites have used and social media apps have used to engage yeah. and. Um, and I, one of the um, one of the thoughts I have is that any team that takes something like this on should have somebody on that team who has deep experience in, in designing engagement. And there are specific programs at Stanford and elsewhere that teach that kind of engagement techniques and so forth. So we want somebody on these you know, whichever team takes this on to have that expertise. And then the other thought I uh, want to underscore is the matchmaking aspect. You know, this is, after all, there is an e-harmony of friendship kind of um, side to this. So, the, you know, the people who would want to read classics are a certain kind of people, people who want to bother with reading Dante's Inferno is a certain kind of person and, and has to be matched with an, another, you know, set of people who have that kind of rigor and, and, and capacity for, and tenacity for, for literature. And that's a different category than the one who wants to read crime fiction or the one that wants to, you know, do maybe a group around romantic comedy and so on and so forth. So I think the matchmaking aspect is very, very significant here. Yeah, I, okay. I don't disagree with that. I, I think it's good. So, but you know, just make sure that it's when you're talking about matchmaking, it's also friendship matchmaking, not just necessarily. It is friendship you know, matchmaking. It is friendship matchmaking. It's primarily friendship <laughs> matchmaking. The romance, I, I would say, the romance may happen or not, but really, what we are doing is friendship matchmaking. Absolutely. Yep. So, um, who else wants to speak? Lalit, do you want to speak? I see you on the audio. <coughs> yeah, sure. Uh, sorry, I'm not on video, but hello, everyone. My name is Lalit okay. Kumar. Yeah. My name is Lalit Kumar. Uh, I have also been toying with this idea, you know, about building a social network uh, around, you know, some shared interests, especially literature and books and films and poetry and so on, right? Because as we all know, the shared interest or the shared passion, you know, it drives deeper connections between people and that's what most of the folks are looking for, right? So I have some ideas, uh, Shramana, and one ancillary idea to this is also, uh, you know, I heard Emily and Tony and you speak, right? Um, and I kind of relate to some of the features and some of the uh, ideas that you folks articulated. And on the ancillary, I also had another kind of an idea related to the creators, right? Say for writers, for example, or painters who draws or sketches, right? So how do, you know, some of the amateur, I would say amateur who are not professional, right? Uh, uh, amateur writers uh, or amateur, you know, painters, who share deep interest in painting or, you know, writing and kind of writes uh, uh, for his own sake, but keeps it to himself or herself, right? So how do you create a network of, you know, this kind of creators, right? Uh, and 
so that they are able to take their creations out in the market, right? Again, through shared network of That's people. a different idea. That's not this idea. It is an idea, and you can work on that idea. If that's your passion, you should work on that idea. You know, these are, you know, the reason I publish these ideas <clears throat> into our community and, and into the world at large, world at large, is to to trigger other ideas and, and related ideas. So, yes, yeah, absolutely, you can take on that. If creation if the writers or the painters is your primary passion, you should think about how to create a network for that community. This is that's not this idea. This idea is a very different idea. This is a consumer Correct. of culture idea as opposed to a producer of culture idea. And those are two completely different uh, two completely different networks, I think. Correct, Ashram. I agree to what you said. I was thinking that, you know, this idea kind of also builds upon you know, what you have articulated, right? It could be a feature in the same kind of a network as well. That's what I was trying to get to. Maybe. Maybe. Because if you are enabling that, you know, the friendship matchmaking or if you are enabling a, uh, you know, the group formation around literature or film, right? Uh, that kind of also builds upon, uh, you know, that you are enabling building a close circle of writers or close circle of you know content That's creators you talk one, about of user the, generated content. one of the features could be a writer's group correct you talked about the you know the user generated content content right so i was kind of trying to build upon that idea it, it could also mm -hmm. be part of the same platform so that's I what see. i was okay. kind of hinting at yeah, yeah. okay good point because ever, All right, look, whatever this is sorry yeah. one thought Whatever I think you articulated, right, is about building a network around the shared interest, right? Yes. So that's you right. can enable various functions, you know, uh, if you are able to build that network. That's what I try to mean, you know. It yeah. could benefit the readers. It could benefit the writers. It could benefit, you know, uh, uh, people who just want to form friendship. So it could benefit in various ways. And all this kind of ties down to, you know, you. I think the one... Uh, if you dilute it, it will not work. Uh, one feedback yeah. I will give you is if you dilute it, it will not work. You have to kind of stay, stay focused on a core idea and a set of core functionalities that you do really well. And if you dilute it, um, it's not going to work is my uh, one feedback. All right, folks, we're running out of time because I have to also do two entrepreneur pitches still. Um, so if we have time, we can come back after those pitches to this discussion. So. Let's go to the entrepreneur pitch session. Um, remember, this is a safe working session, just quick expectation setting. We are completely on your side. So I will give you feedback. Um, you can agree or disagree with the feedback. It's your venture. You will do what you want. My job is to just give you feedback. So Henrietta is the project. Pedro Guardado is the entrepreneur from Baltimore, Maryland. Pedro, please unmute your line and talk about what you're doing with Henrietta. What a wonderful name. Thank you for inviting me, everyone. Um, great to speak to everyone. So, yeah. Hi, I'm Pedro Gordado, co-founder and CEO for Henrietta. I'm a former Naval Hospital corpsman that went off to pursue science studies where I gravitated towards technology. Our co-founder is Christina Princess, who holds a master's degree in bioinformatics from Johns Hopkins and is a data analyst. Our full stack developer is Jamish Parik, founder of Pedals Up, a software development company. Our advisor is Jamis Basoya, is an Ethereum and Hyperledger Fabric lead developer at Tezos India Foundation. Next slide. So that was one. So yeah, here at Henrietta, we are reestablishing the patient doctor relationship. Why does it need changing? Because there are too many hurdles that both patient and doctors have to go through to see each other. Next. The patient begins by having to navigate the complex healthcare landscape to find the best plan that best fits their needs. It may be employer provided, government subsidized, or self purchased the healthcare plan. Next, patients have to identify doctors who are in their network and accept their plan. This is the most frustrating part, the billing. Patients receive services without knowing what the cost will be and are surprised to receive multiple bills and different services that may have been out of network. Unpaid medical bills are the top reason why Americans file for bankruptcy. The doctor stuck in a similar predicament. Now you can go back to the doctor. Thank you. The doctor stuck in a similar predicament. They must accept a payment plan that dictates their schedule. 
to receive reimbursement from third-party payers, they must squeeze patients into short time slots while maintaining compliance with all other requirements. The outcome is less effective treatment, no time for preventative care, and dissatisfied customers. In the end, everyone resents the system. Next slide, please. The solution, build a decentralized network with a financial tech services built into the platform where patients can choose which doctor they want and negotiate the price up front. With a payment agreed upon, patients can see their doctor without any worry, with the additional freedom to, to stay or go with any doctor for their next visit. This gives power back to doctors and allows them to run their own practice. Henrietta is cutting out the middleman. Next slide. Two ways to generate revenue in phase one. Fee for all transactions made on the platform and a monthly subscription for an, for an electronic healthcare record for the doctor. Next slide. I go to market plan, direct primary care. We're reaching out to doctors that are already taking uh, payments directly from patients. Grassroots organizing. Collaborate with community leaders and identify families in need of affordable healthcare. Independent contractors. Target those workers who are not eligible to receive healthcare coverage and early adopters, those who are not happy with the conventional healthcare system and looking for an affordable alternative. Next slide. So what differentiates Henrietta from other platforms is that it provides an affordable and educational user-friendly interface that creates community and trust between doctors and patients. Next slide. Financial projection. So right now there's uh, a rough estimate of, of Direct primary care providers who are already taking their cash up front at 1275 If we start them at a monthly cost for an EHR that's $270, we can uh, achieve a projected annual revenue of $4 million. The total, prime, total number of primary care providers in the U.S. is 250000 If we apply that same math, we can achieve an annual revenue of $800 million. And this is for the EHR alone for the patient transaction that's still being determined. Pedro, can you help me understand this slide, uh, this one, two, three, the three points? Is this, you already have 1,275 primary care providers no, no, no. who are this is just paying how... $270? No, 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 this is just a, a projection. We have, no, we don't have that. We have 25 doctors who have acknowledged us, are excited about it, and waiting for us to come up with our, we have our MVP and prototype out already. So we're we reaching out to them once we come up with our marketing strategy and plan, and then we start validating our idea. So you haven't started yet. You, you're at the MVP stage, and you have, you're just talking to doctors at the moment to yes. just get some validation. Correct. Can you go back to the competition slide and uh, give me a sense of – a double click down on the compet competitive analysis and tell me who are the players, who's doing what, and why you are going to win this. So for us, none of them have financial services to direct primary care to, uh, uh, doctors. They're the ones taking cash because they can take cash and completely circumvent the administrative portion of, you know, handling money. They can have reduced um, services, 30 40 50 $60 a month for their patient, or they can do a one-time fee for, you know, $30, $40, Epic Health, they don't do none of that because they are still um, going towards uh, doctors who are taking uh, third-party payers like Medicare, Medicaid, um, private insurance, things like that. They're still, they're still catering to that. We're giving access to people who are uh, we're giving access to, uh, to patients who can get quick and easy access to uh, quick, uh, cheap uh, doctor uh, services. But there are companies doing direct telemedicine. People are, you can actually today, if you, we have done in our uh, thought leaders in healthcare IT, we have case studies of companies that are doing direct telemedicine, just like you're talking about, where you can, um, you know, you can go in and, and request a doctor and, and just do have a consultation, get a prescription, and so on. Correct. But their pain point for patients, for those doctors are patient volume. They don't get – they need to be able to sustain a business model with enough people who are subscribed paying that 40 50 a month. People go to those services when they need something immediately, but we need to be yeah. able to get them that population behind them, that network effect. And we use a lot of branding strategy, Henrietta becoming that, that household name that can get you what you need immediately without any of that hassle. 
You don't have to enroll during a period given by the government to be eligible for certain plan A, B, C, or D. You don't have to go through, you know, these qualification uh, processes for government assistance. You just look up your doctor, see that they're available, and pay them up front. None of those services do that. And, and is, does insurance cover all, any of this or no? No, they don't have to. I mean, that's something that we can do maybe later, but so getting involved with insurance. Out of pocket, pure out-of-pocket service from any sure. doctor anywhere that you want to make right. available through your net, through your site? Yes. Okay. And what are your questions? What brings you here? Um, just being able to grow from our – well, one, we look for money, correct. That's a big hurdle for us because we need to build that EHR, PHR, but we only want to do that until we've got – so our first MVP can register patients and doctors and get them, you know, an appointment scheduled and pay up front. But we don't actually have an EHR to track all of your information, which comes with another world of possibilities. But we don't have that because we're limited by – what well, our resources. So right now we have to come up with a clever way to onboard patients and doctors, and they like it. Well, doctors do. Patients like it when they're injured or when they have that immediate need to seek medical assistance. So uh, let me address your point about raising funding. Where you are right now and the way you're pitching this is not – ready for funding at all. It needs a lot of work for you to be Correct. able to show enough validation and, um, and and even this pitch needs to be restructured quite significantly. So um, at the moment, I don't think you have any option other than bootstrapping this to that fundability stage. Um, you know, if you, I will spend some time afterwards talking about how to use one million by one million. If you decide you want to use one M by one M, I'll be happy to work with you. But this is not ready to be introduced to investors yet. I agree. Yes. So that's what we're working on right now. So anything that can help us throughout that process, we'll be, we'll be you know, be grateful for it. That will definitely get us where we need to be. Okay, well, hang on. Let me finish the other presentation, and then I'll explain to you how to use 1M by 1M. All right, Holden Nash, Arcadia, right. California. Uh, hi, everyone. So my name is Holden Nash. I'm the CEO and founder of Alia Entertainment and our web application, the Arena. So we are, going, we are trying to create uh, the world's first live stream uh, e-gambling platform. And we want to try and merge two of the um, most explosive industries right now, live streaming and e-gaming. And we want to try and address some of the problems that are maligning both the industries. So first off, uh, YouTube and Twitch, uh, we find don't uh, have enough incentive for content creators. And especially since YouTube restructured their ad revenue, they're not providing people and specifically independent creators with enough monetary incentive to develop new content and to um, create new experiences to engage users with. And if anyone has ever used an internet gambling site, which is a great deal of people, about 64% of U.S. adults, then um, you know that sites are oftentimes plagued with pop-up ads, banner ads, you know, getting redirected to a number of different sites and it just drives people away, and it doesn't incentivize, um, you know, habitual usage. It doesn't bring people back onto your page. It pushes people away, and we want to address that. And um, also, a lot of e-gambling sites already assume that people have some knowledge of gaming. It, it's not meant for people who are just coming into the marketplace. They just want to have a new experience. They structure it like you're already a professional gambler, and if you're not, then you're not really going to get anywhere. So due to COVID-19, Internet gaming has um, been increasing rapidly at about 11.5%. And with that rise has come an increased criminality and expo it's exposed a lot of the weaknesses in the industry and that these websites don't have protections for users and they don't have enough cybersecurity installed to um, ensure people's money is protected, their information is protected, and it creates a lot of distrust amongst established players. Um, next slide. 
So we want to create um, a live stream gaming platform. So like I said, it's increased by 11.5% per year. And the industry for sports gambling in the United States is about a $500 billion a year market. And then on-demand live streaming is close to $100 billion a year. And recently, actually, many states are going to begin legalizing e-gambling within their within the state. And the United States might be doing a broadband federal legislation. But at the current moment, at the beginning of 2021, about 48 states will legalize e-gambling. So our website would be able to penetrate into pretty much every area of the United States. Uh, next slide. So. <clears throat> We want to focus on several key areas, increasing site legitimacy. We want to increase uh, live stream feed, you know, for pro sporting events. We want to make it more accessible to everyone. And we want to make sure quality is there. It's professional quality. It isn't something that's going to constantly be buffering and glitching out. It's something that's going to be constant. And then we want to provide people with a simple and revolutionary transactional gambling proxy. It distributes earnings in a completely new fashion. and it's going to allow anyone to get in on gaming, where regardless of your skill level, and still be able to be profitable in a very um, quick and efficient manner. Next slide. So this is just a bit about the market opportunity. Like I said, 64% of U.S. adults gambled in 2016. It's globally, globally, it's a $3 trillion a year industry. The biggest market is in the United States. And um, the United States is also where the most losses come because people play here the most. And then profits for internet gambling sites have been increasing year after year, and it's approaching almost $50 billion across across the market entirely. And every single year, we see a steady increase with COVID. That increase is going to go at an even quicker uh, quicker rate. Next slide. So this is just comparing two of the biggest players in the industry right now, Boveda and Bet365, to what model we want to create. So both the sites have um, – Boveda has a more – new interface and it provides a better experience as a whole, but they still haven't managed to capture the full market potential that their site has. They don't offer all of the same options and they limit their event live stream abilities and therefore the engagement that they can generate with people. Bet365 has that same issue with a horribly um, invasive interface and it's just not user friendly at all. It's very difficult to use. They just offer a little bit more event variety, but still they don't incorporate a live stream element and they've um, and they failed to produce globally available content for for gaming in general. And that's what we want to address with the arena. We want to provide people with more website options. We want to provide them with a friendlier interface and we want to open it up to a broader audience across the globe. My name is so this is just a slide about me, the founder. I am Currently pursuing a business degree, I founded two companies in the past, both of which were not successful. But um, that's just my history in business, a uh, gaming company and a uh, advertising business. And I am a management and a team uh, leader. Want to Next do slide, this please. Gambling company. What is your experience in gambling? Are you? Is this something that you do on a regular basis? I have. Experiencing gambling in general, internet gambling, I've been exploring these sites for a while, and I just failed to find a site that kind of worked for me. So I wanted to try and create a new gaming experience. Okay. Uh, first and foremost, I personally have absolutely no experience in gambling, and I don't intend to have any experience in gambling. So I don't think I would be the best mentor for you on this venture. You need to find somebody who has experience with gambling, has interest in gambling, and so forth. But um, you're, you're, you seem very young. I'm, I'm also questioning a little bit on whether this is the right thing for you to do, but that's really, of course, your choice. Right, of course, yeah. Um, just something I'm a little passionate about and I want to I want to see created. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I I I it would be completely for me it would be completely speaking out of turn if I try to discourage you from doing this. Um so I will not do that, but um 
but given the fact that you are so incredibly young, if you were my son, I would ask you not to do this. But good luck with well, whatever you choose to do. My mom isn't. My mom isn't psyched about it, but um, she's trying to be supportive. Well, I will not try to be supportive of this one. <laughs> okay. So um, uh, here, uh, um, let me give you a little bit of information on how to use one m by one m if you're doing a venture and uh, and you want to work with us on that. Before I do that, let's um, let's ask you for help. Um, if you like what we do here, please refer one m by one m to serious entrepreneurs who are looking for serious, constructive help. We believe entrepreneurship is a very hard path, and um, it's going to be enormously challenging to build a company, and we can only help those entrepreneurs who have a realistic understanding of how difficult this path is going to be and how much work it's going to entail. Now, if you're willing to do that kind of rigorous work, then all our resources are at 1m1m.com. You can uh, look at the blog series. You can, uh, that's free. It's very rich and it is free. You can look at the Entrepreneur's Journeys book series, which is based on the Entrepreneur's Journeys blog series, and these are collections of 12 to 16 books each. You can start learning there. Um, these roundtables happen every week. You're most welcome to join as, lo as much as you want to. The premium program is for extensive methodology guidance. The curriculum is available. Digital curriculum is available. That's many hundred hours worth of curriculum. We help you with business development. We have an extensive network. We help you with that network, access to that network. And we help you with strategy consulting, coaching, mentoring, whatever you call it. Similar sessions like these roundtables but they are private members only. And we do help you with financing. We do have a network of hundreds of investors, and uh, that network is available to our premium members, but you have to be ready to be introduced to investors before we can introduce you um, to that network. And there is also this issue of investor entrepreneur fit. Just like you're trying to achieve product market fit, you're going to also have to look for investor entrepreneur fit, and that's something we try to help you do. If you go to the seed capital section of our blog, you will see investor after investor interview after investor interview. You can also listen to that in our podcast channel um, on all the podcast platforms. Um, listening to some of these interviews or reading some of these interviews of investors would give you a sense of how people think. And, and just like today, Fabrice said, their focus is in marketplaces. Well, that's a particular kind of investor, and people who are doing marketplaces would find a fit with this investor. And almost every investor who has a VC fund or, or is an angel investor has an investment thesis, and you're going to need to work with that and come up with something that works with their investment thesis. Okay. So um, I would say go to the self-assessment page on the website and find the validation questions, the due diligence questions, the self-assessment questions. These are questions investors will ask you. We have made it available for free. Please use them to line up your DAX and do your strategic planning. If you get stuck, 1M, by 1M Basic is a very good curriculum option to, for you to study to plug your knowledge gaps. So dig around on the website, take a look at the programs, premium, basic, look at the FAQs, video FAQs, look at what it takes to raise money. We have investor introductions right at the top of the website. Um, the curriculum is discussed in great detail on the website. It is a case study-based curriculum. We have, you know, hundreds of case studies of successful entrepreneurs. And uh, our methodology is lean, capital-efficient, bootstrap startups. And the philosophy is bootstrap first, raise money later. That's it. We have free roundtables, two more in December, and then in January we're going to go back to normal schedule. Every week in December we have a bit of a 
break because of the holidays. And then we also have three more rendezvous in December, which are on LinkedIn Live, Facebook Live, and Twitter Live. That's it. Um, if you have questions, please feel free to let us know. Uh, you can dial in through these, this bridge. And while you're doing that, let me also introduce you to Irina Patterson. Irina at one by one mcom If you have questions about the program, Irina would be your person to call. Right. Anybody? Questions? Comments? Thank you very much. Anybody? No, nope. thank you very much. Have a great day. You're very welcome. Thank you. All right. Looks like nobody else has questions. We are going to adjourn uh, for today, and we will meet you back here next week. Thank you for coming. Bye-bye.